I love the story about a man named Jimmy. Jimmy, he was the focused, he was the brilliant brother. He was the graduate from the American Naval Academy. He became the nuclear submarine officer, later becoming the governor and ultimately the president of the United States. Billy, on the other hand, y'all know Billy, the brother Billy, he was unfocused, he was eccentric, and he was a graduate of the School of Hard Knocks. Y'all know what I'm talking about? That's Billy. He, uh, he worked at the local filling station in Plains, Georgia. And the year was 1976. Jimmy Carter was walking down Pennsylvania Avenue to be sworn into the presidential office with his mother, Lillian. She was walking al alongside of him, and, and a reporter came up to Lillian, and she said, Oh, I bet you are so proud of your son. And she looks at the reporter, and she says, Which one? Which one? I, I love that story because Lillian had a fierce defense of all of her children. She loved all of her children equally, and she refused to admit distinctions that would elevate one child over the other. I want to talk to you this morning about a topic that I have never heard a preacher preach about. You don't hear it in pulpits. In fact, this topic is celebrated in heaven, but rejected by humanity. I want to talk to you this morning about a deep, soul-searching obedience in obscurity. Obedience in obscurity. Now, I want, I want you to turn your Bibles this morning to Luke chapter 6, Luke chapter 6. And we've been in this whole collection of messages called the 12. We talked about all of the disciples. We profiled the disciples. We, we chose a, a scripture passage. We unpacked that scripture. We applied those scriptures. And today, we're going to look at some disciples that have no biblical content about them going to be hard. Y'all pray for a preacher. Uh, th these, these disciples we know as James, son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Thaddeus. Nothing in Scripture is about them except for Luke chapter 6. That's where we're going to be. Luke chapter 6, verses 12 through four, uh, 14. Through, we'll, we'll read through 16, verse 16. All right, so Luke chapter 6, starting in verse 12. One of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. When morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them, whom he also designated apostles. Simon, whom he named Peter, his brother Andrew, James, that's the son of Zebedee. We've talked about him. John, talk about him next week. Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon, who was called the Zealot, Judas, son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became the traitor. And then there were three. Three obscure apostles. Nothing striking. Nothing stunning. Nothing spectacular enough for them even to be recorded in Scripture. James, the son of Alphaeus, he's overlooked by all the James that 
we all know. We know James, son of Zebedee. He's the inner tribe, the inner circle of Jesus. We know James, the half-brother of Jesus. He wrote the book of James. But nothing is recorded about the son of Alphaeus. So let's back up a little bit and ask the question, who is Alphaeus? Who is James's father? Now, Alphaeus is a very rare name in Scripture. It's actually only recorded twice in the entire Bible. So flip over to Mark chapter 2. Uh, flip back to, to Mark chapter 2. And uh, this, is, this is fascinating. This is where Alphaeus is mentioned the second time. Mark chapter 2. And look at verse 14. As he, that's Jesus, walked along, he saw Levi. Now, if you'll remember, Levi is the nickname of Matthew, the tax collector. All right? So Jesus saw Matthew, the tax collector, son of who? Alphaeus. Sitting at the tax collector's booth, follow me, Jesus told him. And Levi got up and followed him. Now, this is interesting. Who knew? James, son of Alphaeus, is a brother to Matthew, the tax collector. This is fascinating. And, it, and it's, it's crazy because James is a zealot, much like Simon was a zealot. And a zealot is a political party that started 20 years before Jesus came into the scene. And the zealots were, in fact, zealous. To the point they were political insurrectionists. They wanted to overthrow the Roman government. All right? So James is a zealot. Simon is a zealot. And Matthew, the brother of James, son of Alphaeus, is a tax collector? Now, I don't know about y'all, but y'all think y'all got family issues. This family has some major family issues. It's bad. I mean, I, 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 I'm thinking they're probably sitting around the dinner table, and, and they're like, hey, uh, Traitor, I mean, Matthew, pass the hummus. I mean, I mean, you're talking about vehement disagreement. Somebody on the inner tribe is taking money from us to give to the Roman government. I mean, that's traitorous. That's slimy. That's scummy. Your own family? But Matthew and James, son of Alphaeus, are both disciples. They're both disciples. This tells us a lot about who Jesus chooses. Now, the fact that Matthew and, and James are disciples gives us a principle that I feel like if we were to truly believe in, it would change everything about us. So if you're like me and your heart beats and you have breath in your lungs and you have family issues, can I give you a biblical principle this morning? I want you to write this down. The gospel redeems us vertically with God and horizontally with others. The gospel is holistic. The gospel doesn't just redeem us with God. It redeems us with humanity. See, faith will affect the way you treat your family. I'll take that a step further. 
if we cannot extend, listen, if we cannot extend forgiveness to others, we cannot receive faith in Christ. Huh. You're like, really? Yeah. See, the reason I know that is not just because Scripture, but you know that people who are forgiven forgive other people. Forgiven people forgive other people. Now flip 13 chapters later to Mark chapter 15. <laughs> Mark 15. And we learn something about these obscure disciples, and particularly James. This is fascinating. And, and I'll have to admit, I pity James a little bit in Mark chapter 15. Look at what Mark 15 says in verse 40. Some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, and listen to James's nickname. Mary, mother of James the Less, some of your translations say younger, and of Joseph and of Salome. This guy named James was identified in society with a nickname of a person that is below the average standard citizen. Imagine if that was your nickname. Well, there he goes. Chad the Less, you know. <laughs> you know, there she is. So and so the less. Well, when you look at the actual Greek writing of this nickname, the, the Greek word for the less, his nickname, is Mikru. Mikru. It's used three times in the New Testament, this Greek word. In Acts chapter 8, Mikru refers to the lowly people of Samaria. We know all about the Samaritans. And you go further, Hebrews chapter 8, Mikru describes the lowest outcast in Israel. All right? So the word Mikru is used to describe the exact opposite of those who are great. James the less. As opposed to James the great, son of Zebedee. So you have James the great, and you have James the the less. And the good news for you and for me is that there's nobody that's too less in society. There's nobody that's too great in society for God to redeem. Is that grace is all encompassing. No matter who you are, the influence that you have, God can choose you. Now, I love this quote by Richard Foster, and he's known as a theological workhorse for spiritual disciplines, and, and he has observed what's going on in 21st century, and listen to what he says in regards to the 21st century. He said, superficiality is the curse of our age. Superficiality is the curse of our age. This is the doctrine of instant gratification. Addicted to continuous hits of insatiable dopamine. Lifeintelligence.com studied what's known as the fame motive from a psychological and physiological perspective, and they discovered that the desire for fame led to a negative mental health outcome. Not only negative mental health, but anxiety, body image issues, depression, violence, insecurity, and large spending habits. The Business Insider discovered that kids in the United States no longer want to be astronauts. That they, they no longer want to be musicians. They no longer want to be teachers or even professional athletes. Kids want to be 
YouTube sensation. You can make millions of dollars being a YouTube sensation. I want to be a star. I, I like what Jim Carrey said about popularity. I don't agree with a lot of what Jim Carrey says, but this is brilliant. I would not trade the good old days of poverty and obscurity for anything. Obscurity is a gift that prepares you. In fact, if you think about it, most of the things that are valuable in this life were created in obscurity. An embryo is developed in obscurity. Doctors are trained studying hours in obscurity. Discipline is formed in obscurity. Look at the Bible heroes. Moses spent 40 years tending sheep in obscurity. David wrote the Psalms in, in obscurity. Joseph spent years in prison in obscurity. John the Baptist preached to stones in the desert in obscurity. That's how we get Baptist church, because people act like stones in the desert, right? He's just preaching. He's just preaching in obscurity. Obscurity. Listen, culture says that, look, you cannot have obscurity and success at the same time. Obscurity is the polar opposite of success. But that's not what Scripture says. These are not dichotomies. I'm convinced. Listen, what we do in obscurity defines who we are. Defines who we are. And if you're under the age of 30, I, I want you to write this down. Write this down on paper. Write this down in your soul. Let this sink in. The definition of success is being faithful, not famous. The definition of success is to be faithful, not famous. I, I uh, reached out to a friend this week, and he... Uh, was a ministry friend of mine and still is and he wasn't a pastor he he was over students and his title was next gen minister and he just accepted a pastor this week to be a senior pastor never been a senior pastor before and so i started doing a little research on the church and come to find out the pastor who was there, he wasn't very old, maybe mid-40s, but he's transitioning out to pastor more pastors. And the pastor who was there has an international following, like known across the world. In fact, some of his sermons would be viewed over half a million times. <laughs> there may be 100 people watching this right now in comparison, okay? A half a million. And, and I, I called him, and I, I said, God has amazing things for you. And you are equipped for this, and God will empower you for this. But my prayer, you know what my prayer was? My, I, I said, I pray that he would feel the pressure from God to be faithful over the pressure from man to be famous. I, I think that needs to sink in a little bit. Because is, is it me or am I seeing a lot of Famous people destruct their faith being deconstructed and destroyed. And I am convinced the reason that is is that destruction is always at the end of a life. Listen, this is so important. Destruction is always at the end of a life when fame exceeds faithfulness. Whew. 
I love what the 18th century Moravian pastor named uh, Count Zinzendorf said. He is a brother to Count Dracula. No, just kidding. Count Zinzendorf, a Moravian preacher, said this. This is amazing. Preach Christ, die, and be forgotten. Preach Christ, die, and be forgotten. Can't we be honest? That's most of us. That's most of us. We live. We work. We raise a family. And we die. <laughs> we live. We work. We raise a family. We die. We have a nice service. We sing Go Rest High. Coupled beautifully with a rendition of Beulah Land. And then we go to the church. We eat fried chicken. Go home and take a nap. And then people think of us. Maybe when they mow around our tombstone. <laughs> Chad, thanks for the encouragement. But these three disciples, they were unknown. But listen, obscurity is no indication of the heart. And what matters to man does not matter to God. And unfortunately, what matters to God does not matter to man. What matters to God, Jeremiah tells us, the heart, motive, every action. The Lord searches the heart. It's what the Lord searches. So we may or may not be remembered in history books. We may not have a large platform, but I can guarantee you this. Jesus is taking notice of your heart motive. That's what Jesus is doing. And what, what's making the headlines in culture is not making the headlines to Christ. What's obscure to us is not obscure to Jesus. Obedience in obscurity is what Jesus is looking for. Obedience in obscurity. Now, I want you to flip back to Revel all the way to the end. Revelation 21. This is amazing. Revelation, I, I didn't realize this was here until I was researching for this sermon, but Revelation 21 tells us about this new Jerusalem, the bride of the Lamb, and listen to what Revelation says about the walls around the new Jerusalem in verse 14. The wall of the city had 12 foundations. And on them were the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. Thaddeus, Simon, James the less were not so less with Jesus. Isn't that neat? Unknown to the world, but known to God. No treasures on earth, but treasures in heaven. I'll be honest, I, I've been to Washington, D.C. twice. And it's interesting, I've been to most of the museums, most of the monuments, but what gets me every time, if you've never been, you've got to go to Arlington Cemetery. Uh, I, it just does something in my bones. And when you see the tomb of the unknown soldier, it is all striking. And on November the 11th, 1921, President Warren Harding made a presidential address at the burial of an unknown American soldier at Arlington Cemetery. And this is so good. Listen to what President Harding says. We do not know the eminence of his birth. But we do know the glory of his death. He died for his country. And greater devotion hath no man than this. He died unquestioning, uncomplaining, with faith in his heart and hope in his lips that his country should triumph and its civilization survive. And this is the best part. The unknown 
make us a grateful republic. And our part is to atone for the losses of the heroic dead by making a better republic. Don't miss that. What makes our republic great are the people that we don't even know. Church, not the presidents, not the preachers, not Hollywood, not the elites, those who are not in the annals of history, those who are obscure. Now, if you go to the western panel of the tomb of the unknown soldier, inscribed inside the tomb, or, or right outside the, the western panel, it, it says this, Here rests in honored glory an American soldier known but to God. Listen, you know when you look at Christianity, ha have you ever considered that Christianity expands most with the tomb, tombs of the unknown soldiers of Christ? That's when Christianity spreads the most. I, I'm talking about a mom and a dad who pray with their child and share Jesus with their family. I'm talking about a businessman who works hard every day. He lives, he breathes, and walks the gospel of Christ at work. I'm not talking about big tent evangelists, big tent revivals. I'm talking about ordinary and obscure followers of Jesus. I love what John says. He says, he must become greater so I can become less. Mm. I'm so glad that Jesus chose Peter, John, and James. But aren't you glad today that he chose James the less? Simon the zealot? Judas the Thaddeus? I'm glad. Why? Because, listen, obedience in obscurity. Don't miss the blessing. Obedience in obscurity is what Christ requires of me. Can you pray with me?